So let's start the introduction. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you here again for another uh, session of our QRC seminar. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Michael Stern from the Baritan University in Tel Aviv to, uh, with you with us today in person. He will be here in person for today, uh, tomorrow, and also Wednesday, right? Um, Professor Michael Stern, he graduated from Ecole Centrale Paris in 2000 with a specialization in computer science and electrical engineering. And he during his studies, he, he developed a system on a chip, SOC, dedicated for network security and cryptography and founded a startup company named Eva B. Uh, in 2004, he decided he returned to academia and went for a PhD in the fields of semiconductor physics and optical spectroscopy. His, uh, his PhD was at the Weizmann Institute and where he investigated the phase diagram of the polar excitons in coupled quantum wells. Um, he was postdoc at the Weizmann Institute also and worked on fractional quantum Hall effect. And then um, he opted for another mesoscopic, uh, for another postdoc in mesoscopic physics. Uh, and he spent time there doing that in the quant quantronic groups at Saclay. Huh? Uh, in 2015, he returned to Israel uh, to start a new quantum quantum nanoelectronics lab, we can see now, and uh, essentially where he's at uh, today, and he focuses in where he focuses his research on hybrid quantum systems. Professor Stern, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for your time and the the kindness of of giving a talk in person to us. Please go ahead. Thanks. So thank you very much for uh, for everything, for the invitation, for being here with you, in the TII in Abu Dhabi. I'm very happy to to be here. Um, thank you for uh, Gianluigi for initiating uh, this uh, venue. Um, so um, yes, so my um, my talk today will be about a tunable superconducting flux qubit. So uh, Michael Stern from the Quantum Nanoelectronics Laboratory in Bar Ilan University, which is close to Tel Aviv, and. Uh, we belong to, uh, so our lab is a QNano lab, and we belong to two institutes in uh, Barilan University. The first uh, quest is for uh, quantum research, the second for uh, nanotechnology research, and since we are doing both, we belong to both. And uh, what, uh, what I want to, to advertise is that we, what we are willing to do is to work with hybrid quantum system. So uh, on one hand, we have the world of uh, superconducting circuits, which are easy to manipulate, but lose quite efficiently the quantum information. On the other hand, you have the world of uh, spins who can keep the quantum information for a very long time, but are quite difficult to speak with. And uh, we are interested in, uh, interested in bridging, bridging, uh, bri uh, bri bridging uh, these two, these two worlds by the intermediate of this uh, of this tool, which is a superconducting flux qubit. So I'm going today to speak about, a little bit about uh, this tool and how we fabricate this tool and how we, we can use this tool eventually for, for coupling the two systems. So um, I will begin with a small introduction on superconducting qubits. So uh, when uh, you are all familiar to this quantum harmonic oscillators, so uh, when you have a, a spring with mass, you, do, you, you can get out of it a frequency, which goes like square root of k over, over m. And uh, if you solve this quantum mechanically, what you get is an ensemble of levels which are equally spaced. And uh, the distance between the level is equal to h bar omega. And of course, it's possible to uh, make an analogy between this mechanical system to an electrical system, just by changing the variables and the constant. Uh, and X and P are uh, played by the phase, of, which is uh, the phase, or if you want, the, the flux threading the, the, the inductor, while Q is equivalent of the, of the momentum. And in order that this circuit will behave quantum mechanically, we need to have two conditions. First condition is that the distance between the level must be big in front of the temperature. The second 
very important condition is that the width of the level must be small in front of the distance between the level. So these two uh, conditions are satisfied when working with superconducting uh, circuits at 20 millikelvin. So, uh, a, so superconducting circuits are a very convenient way to, to study the quantum mechanical properties of matter. Uh, and especially we have uh, with superconducting circuits, a kind of wonder of nature, which is the Josephson junction, which is an element which is at the same time nonlinear and non-dissipated. There are many elements in nature that are nonlinear, but in general they are dissipated. There are many elements in nature that are non-dissipative, but in general they are linear. Here we have a very, very, very uh, special thing, at the same time nonlinear and non-dissipative, and this element that is represented here is a sandwich between aluminum, aluminum oxide, and aluminum. The width of aluminum oxide is typically between 0.5 to 2 nanometer. And uh, the big advantage of this is that rather than having an Hamiltonian, which is a linear Hamiltonian, now we have a an Hamiltonian, which is a cosinus function. Where the potential energy goes like cosinus, the, the cosinus, the, the flux. And rather than having a boring uh, harmonic oscillator, we have now here an unharmonic oscillator, an unharmonic potential. And uh, this gives, uh, if we are concentrated on the, on the, two, on the two level, lowest level, we get a qubit. And this is a, an illustration of uh, the kind of qubit you can build. And this qubit is a so-called transmont qubit. So the dimension here are 40 microns. This is typically 200 microns. So what you see here is an interdigitated capacitor. And in the middle, you have a wire, which plays the role of the inductor. And if you zoom inside, what you see, you see here two Josephson junctions in parallel, which form a squid, OK? This squid will be important for the following. Uh, and um, if I want to increase the coherence time, the behavior, the co coherence and the relaxation time of this uh, system, it was understood in the 2011 in the group of Yale that it's better to put this uh, transpond inside of a three-dimensional cavity to protect it from its environment as well as possible. So this is done by putting the transpond inside of an uh, aluminum uh, cavity. The transmond is a little bit modified. You see here, you have two pads. In the middle, you have a wire. And in the middle, the Josephson junction. And by doing so, it was possible to show that it's possible to increase the relaxation time to tens of microseconds, 60 microseconds here. The, the, the echo coherence time can be 25. Two dates can be even higher, 20, 80 microseconds. OK, so this is very nice, but as you can see, the dimension of such cavity are typically five centimeter by two or something like that. So one can ask whether it's possible to scale such uh, qubits in order to form a quantum computer. And all the effort in the last decade has been to, okay, we have a very good tr tr transform in 3D. Let's try to come back to 2D. And indeed, recently in the group of Princeton, it was understood that by uh, taking special care of the, um, of the interface between uh, a tantalum and the sapphire substrate, it was possible to fabricate a transmond in 2D with a very long uh, relaxation time here, 360 micro, microseconds. Um, and uh, to summarize, I would say, the following. I think I have convinced you that uh, transmond have long coherence time. I think it's also easy to understand that they are relatively easy to fabricate, even if this is a difficult process. At the end, you have only one nonlinear element, which is one Josephson junction, and uh, the parameters of the of the of the transmond are more or less linear on the parameter of the junction. The problem with transmond is that they have rather low anharmonicity. Okay? Because you put a little bit of nonlinearity in the system, this means that uh, you will have uh, problems. And these problems will come. Sorry for this. We have a little issue. One, one second. So it changed? No. Like, it's not changing the slide, right? Uh -huh. 
Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you mean to this, the, uh, the potential part in yes. 2D is it different compared to the original Josephson, Josephson junction? No, no, it's exactly the same potential. The, the, the only difference is that you, you have here this cosinus phi, okay? If you choose correctly the parameters of the uh, of the critical uh, of the critical current uh, persist the critical current and of the capacitance, you can be in a situation where the the flux phi is small, okay, and thus the cosinus phi will be close to phi squared over two, okay. That's why uh, yes exactly. So you you choose you the the idea is that you have to choose. Uh, the the good amount of nonlinearity such that you don't put too much nonlinearity. If you put too much nonlinearity, the transform becomes a Cooper pair box. Okay, and then it loses a little bit of, uh, of coherence. Sorry, one question. Can you just move one slide forward? No. Uh, but then maybe it's this way, right? This maybe it's this thing, right? So how how do you move forward here? Right. Yeah, this way, right? Okay, so do you mind? Yes, now I can. Okay. Yeah. Seems to be working. Sorry for this. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, so um, so it has long coherence time. It is relatively easy to fabricate and control, but by construction, intrinsically, it has a low anharmonicity. And this low anharmonicity means also that it will you will have some problems when we, you will increase the number of transmond. And these problems will come from frequency crowding. These problems will come also from the fact that you need to speak with the transmond at a slow rate. And this means that there is a relatively low intrinsic fidelity of the transform. Uh, the qubit I'm going to speak today is a superconducting qubit, but it's a different qubit. It's called the superconducting flux qubit. And it consists not anymore of one Josephson junction, but one, two, three, four Josephson junction on a ring. Okay. Uh, and this qubit is working in a regime a completely different regime of the, than the transform. The transform is working with a nonlinearity which is very small. The flux qubit is working in a very nonlinear regime. So the flux qubit has long coherence time. And because it's a very nonlinear system, it has a high anharmonicity, which means that this system is really, a, you can really think of it as a two level system. You have a third level, but the third level is very, very, very far, very, very high. Okay, sometimes above the superconducting gap. Okay, and thus uh, close to half a flux quantum, and we, go, we are going to speak about that in a minute. It becomes, it becomes a very good two level system. Second point is that because it's a two-level system, it means that you can speak with the flux with the flux qubit with the fast gates, and reach eventually very high fidelity. Oh, the four chunks, one, two, three, four, right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, what is the lower part? Okay, so in fact, the loop is here. Here, 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 here. Okay, because yeah. the, the the qubit is fabricated by the so-called Dolan technique, where you in fact come with two ang two different angles, okay? You evaporate two different angles. So you see twice the image, okay? And the junction is the uh, the overlap between the two the two angles. So this this line, this here, this is not no, I mean, show me. This. This and this. Yes, it's also a second image. It's the first image of the flux. It's the first image of the mask. Let's imagine you, ima you, you make a first image, okay? So the mask is here, 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 here. 
And then you come with a second, second angle and uh, evaporate uh, second layer. Okay, but and, uh, everything comes with a but here. The flux qubit is uh, much harder to fabricate and control than the transform. And the second but is yes, it has long coherence time, but only at the optimal point. When the flux threading the loop of the qubit is equal to half a flux quantum. Away from that, you will see in a minute, it loses its high coherence. So let's uh, make a very short uh, introduction to flux qubit. So as I've mentioned, we, are, we have a loop. Here is an IFM picture of another flux qubit. Yes. Okay, so you, I'm, yes, I'm going to, to speak about that in a minute. So you see that you have three identical junctions and one which is smaller than the other, okay? So the, small, the ratio between the small junction and the big junction is called alpha, okay? Alpha is always smaller than one. Okay, and when you write now the energy of the system, it's the sum of the Josephson energy of each of the junctions. So you have Ej cos phi 1 plus Ij cos phi 2 plus Ej cos phi 3 plus Ej cos phi 4. Okay, where four, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4 are the, are the phase difference across the junction. Now, since you have a Faraday law, okay, and you are in a loop, there is a relationship between the flux threading the loop and the phase across the junction. And therefore, there is only three independent parameters. So now, in order to get uh, to, to diagonalize this system, you need to introduce also, we, we spoke about potential energy, but you need also to put some kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is coming, as I mentioned in the, already at the beginning, is coming from the charge on the capacitor. So there are, there are many capacitors in this system. You have a capacitance matrix, okay? And there is a way to express the, the kinetic energy as a function of the capacitance matrix of the system. So once you have the Hamiltonian, you solve this uh, Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation of the Hamiltonian, and you get indeed that uh, close to half a flux quantum, you have uh, the ground state and the first excited state that are well isolated from all the other levels. Okay, so this is in gigahertz, the distance here. And now if you take the energy of the first excited state minus the energy of the ground state, you get what we call the, the spectroscopy of a flux qubit. Okay, and you see that the spectroscopy, okay, is characterized by two parameters. There is a first parameter, which is called the gap of the flux qubit or if you want its energy exactly at alpha flux quantum. And there is this slope, okay? Or if you want this persistent current flowing in the loop of the qubit. Okay. So the, at its, um, so the persistent current flowing in the loop of the qubit can be very high, very high. Typically, half a micro ampere. Okay. Um, for in a little flux qubit, the original implementation. Yes, in the original implementation, you can put three, you can put four, you can put five. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, what is the role? Why do you make four junctions? I will explain you. Because if you put. No, I think three in this configuration, I think doesn't work. Exactly. So, this yes. Is, uh, another loop. Uh... <laughs> Exactly. You have always, you have always, you, you know, like it's like in a building when you come from the ground to the first level and then after back, you come back to the ground, you have an odd number, you have an even number or if you want to come back to your original place. So the, the loop it always contains uh, four junctions, even if you see only three, there is always one which is, uh, which is hidden. Okay. Yes. Uh, what is important to mention here is that um, the, the sensitivity of a flux qubit. Uh, you know, all know that the electron spin sensitivity is of the order of 2.8 megahertz per Gauss. The sensitivity of a flux qubit is 500 gigahertz per Gauss, more than five orders of magnitude higher. So it means that any flux noise, okay, will decoher the qubit. 
will modify the energy of the qubit and therefore decoher the qubit. And thus, the only point where you can work with flux qubit is exactly at this point, at the optimal point, where you are immune to flux noise at first order. Okay, even at that point, we will see in the following that you may have effect of flux noise, which come from second order and others. Okay, so a um, little bit of the state of the art, as you mentioned, the first correlation of the flux qubit were with the three junction. Here you see the three junction, but there is a fourth one, which is hidden. Uh, but at that time, the, the, the coherence time were rather low. It was understood in 2005 that it's possible to increase the coherence time up to a, a microsecond. In general, typically between 0.5 to 4 microseconds, T1, T2, except some few uh, examples like uh, this one, where you had uh, this paper of uh, the group of Will Oliver, where they managed to get a, a T1 of 10 microseconds. And the origin for this very um, strong variation of the coherence time is most likely due to the fact that at that time, people were using a very complicated uh, scheme in order to measure the flux qubit with plenty of capacitors, microwave antennas, all of these relax the qubit and create a, a non-controllable environment. So in, in 2014, when I was uh, at uh, Saclay, my postdoc, we, we tried to, uh, to uh, simplify this environment by putting a, a series of flux qubits inside of a copper cavity, okay? In the same way as was what was done for transponding in 3D. And uh, indeed, we uh, saw a quite uh, impressive increase of uh, both uh, of T1 especially. Uh, since that time, uh, people have made uh, other, pro uh, other uh, improvement to the system, for example, by adding big pads to the system, you create a capacitively shunned flux qubit, okay? And this capacitively shunned flux qubit can have T1 of 90 microseconds and a T2 of typical 20, but maybe 50 microseconds is also possible. Uh, but you pay a price. By adding this capacitor means that you reduce the anharmonicity. So it means that you reduce also the uh, possibility to uh, apply fast gates. Uh, and if I come back to this uh, to this uh, work on the flux qubit in 3D cavity, you see that uh, the flux qubit is very, very, very sensitive to the value of alpha. Okay. So by changing alpha from 0 0.61 to 0 0.4, I can vary the gap by almost an order of magnitude. Second point you can see here is that even by doing so, uh, the, the, the relaxation times are variable. They vary a lot. Okay, You have a very good flux qubit, but you have sometimes bad ones. Third problem is what, what about the scalability? How can you use this kind of big cavities of seven centimeter by one? Noise in magnetic field. Um, well, a noise in magnetic field. We try to isolate the qubit from uh, environment. You, you will see in a minute. Of you you have to work at exactly the optimal point. But after that, when you, once you once you are at the optimal point. You are uh, quite protected from. We, you, you, you are going to see. We will uh, discuss this. Okay, so let's speak about uh, the subject of today, which is tunable superconducting flux qubit. So uh, you remember this picture from the beginning? So I, this is a squid. Okay, so it's a so-called symmetric squid because the two junctions are equal. So it's the two junction. Okay, and these two junctions they form an effective junction. Uh, but a uh, generalization of this is what I'm representing here, okay? So that I can have an asymmetric uh, squid where D is a symmetry parameter such that you have a big junction and a smaller junction. So if I'm writing now the energy of this ensemble of two uh, junctions, okay? So I have 
the energy of the first junction plus the energy of the second one. And since we are on a, on a loop, once again, okay, there is a Faraday law, which uh, allows me to drop out one of the, one of the parameters, phi2. And I get a, an equivalent junction, which is controllable by the flux threading uh, the squid. So this, uh, this effective Josephson energy, okay, is varies as a function of phi s, but its variation is controlled by the asymmetry parameter. If the asymmetry parameter d is equal to zero, in the case of a symmetric squid, what happens is that the energy is varying, the effective energy of the junction is varying between one and zero. Okay, so it's very aggressive. If I'm putting d very close to one, okay, I'm seeing that u uh, over ej will be almost constant. So for example, if I'm choosing uh, the, the, so the, the, the effective energy of the junction is always comprised between ej and d times ej. So you want to work, if you want to reduce the influence of the squid, you want to increase d up to one. So this idea of uh, using, the idea of using a squid in order to control the gap of a flux qubit has been already uh, implemented in 2009. Uh, at that time, the idea was to replace the alpha junction by a squid. If you are able to replace the alpha junction of the squid, then you are able to control the gap of the qubit. And controlling the gap of the qubit is essential if you want to make quantum computation. You want to control the gap of each of the, of the qubit that uh, participate in your com computation. And indeed, as you can see, this is our, these are experimental data. You see that by uh, varying the flux F alpha inside of the squid, it was possible to modify the minimal energy of uh, the qubit versus F epsilon, or if you want, the gap of the qubit. Problem is that price to pay is very heavy. Price to pay is a coherence time lower than 10 nanoseconds. So since that time, many experiments have been done in order to improve this. Yes. Point stable. I mean, can you change? Okay. You near this state, near this point. So if you near this uh, stable point, if you change alpha and beta, would it be like the coherence time change so like slowly or spontaneously? You mean that you you want to you want to uh, vary? Yeah, no. This is for a given value of alpha. This is for a given value of f alpha. Okay, okay. So for each value of f alpha, you have a way to control f alpha in the system. So for f alpha being equal to I don't remember exactly, you get this. After that, you get this one. Okay. Yeah, but the so, goal is to find the maximum gap, the parameters of the script such that uh, the Gap you are you are right that there are some points which are better than others, okay? Because the gap will vary in a sinusoidal way, okay? So if you are close to the top or close to the bottom, okay, the gap varies less, okay, and then you are less sensitive to the variation of the gap. So but the bottom line is that. The best uh, relaxation times that were obtained up to now with the flux qubit, uh, tunable flux qubit, were 1.5 microsecond, while the best coherence time, phi to phi, of the order of one microsecond. And that was a little bit uh, problematic. So we tried to improve that. So uh, here is a circuit implementation that uh, was done in a recent paper. So uh, what you see on the left side is a coplanar waveguide, which is uh, coupled galvanically to a series of five uh, tunable flux qubit. Okay, so each tunable flux qubit is uh, made uh, is galvanic coupled, galvanically coupled to the coplanar waveguide resonator. So this uh, resonator is made on a sapphire in order to uh, sapphire is chosen because its tangent delta is very small so that we can expect to have uh, long relaxation times. The coplanar waveguide resonator is built such that its frequency is around 10 gigahertz. 
the quality factor is controlled by uh, the coupling capacitor here and here. So we measure in transmission and it's, con it's chosen to be around 3,500. And finally, what we do, we do five uh, identical flux qubits, which are all galvanically coupled to the CPW, but with different loop size so that we can identify who is who, okay? So each of the flux qubit consists of two loops on the, you have the, the you see the green, uh, the, the yellow, uh, the yellow contour, okay? This is, a, this is a, the total flux qubit, okay? And inside we have this loop, which we call the main loop, where the loop of the qubit, and this loop, which is the loop of the squid. So um, it's important here to mention a very important critical element for the success of this experiment. And the very critical element is the fabric, resides in the fabrication. We need to control very well the fabrication of the qubit and especially the uh, quality of the surface interface between the aluminum and the substrate. So to do that, we used uh, what we call the Caesar germanium MA83 layer, where in fact for, um, so what we do, we make, a, we make a sandwich. We fabricate uh, on top of uh, any kind of wafer, but here we have chosen to work on a sapphire wafer, but we can work on diamond, on silicon, whatever. We put a, an, an MA, MAA layer, which is a spacer, on which we evaporate a thin layer of germanium, typically 60 nanometers. And on top of it, we spin a layer of uh, Caesar, which is a resist, E-beam resist. And then after E-beam lithography, we get this, an E-beam e -beam resist. Uh, so we get this, this scheme. Then we uh, etch the germanium layer by uh, reactive ion etching. And then we come to the important point is that we can make oxygen ashing as long as we want so that we can clean very well the surface of the sapphire or of the wafer where we are going to deposit our uh, aluminum layer. So the advantage of the germanium layer is that it is very rigid and it is also very immune to oxygen ashing. Then we come with a two angle evaporation, as we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so uh, here we use also uh, sp some special um, evaporation. We work at low temperature, not extremely low temperature. We make a first evaporation at minus 50 degrees, which is followed by a dynamic oxidation at 20 microbar and another layer at seven degrees. So what is important is to well control the process in terms of temperatures. And once you have done that, you lift off in an MP. And uh, once again, the advantage of this technique are its accuracy, its reproducibility, due to the fact that the germanium mask is immune to cleaning, and the fact that the germanium mask is rigid, and the fact that we are controlling very well the temperature of evaporation, and the fact that at low temperature, the graininess of the uh, aluminum is smaller so that we get a better uh, oxide. Okay, so we discussed a minute ago about the fact that uh, what should I do in order to reduce decoherence is to, I would like to mitigate the, the problem of decoherence. And the idea is to reduce the dependence of the gap on phi s. And to do that, let's first see how is the gap of a flux qubit depends on the flux threading the squid when we uh, suppose that we have an, a symmetric squid. So if we take a symmetric squid, d equals zero, everything on the alpha junction, you see that what is happening is that the gap is going up very high and down very quickly, okay? 60 gigahertz, okay? Absolutely not under control, okay? While if you put, uh, some kind of asymmetry, a high level of asymmetry, you can mitigate this dependence. You don't need, in fact, you don't need 
to control a flux qubit on 60 gigahertz range. What you want is to control a flux qubit on the one to two gigahertz range. Okay. So uh, here I'm making you a zoom. Oh. Yeah, your still far from the two I even don't know what happens here for d equals zero. <laughs> no, here they are very far. What is happening here, I cannot tell you because uh, I, I don't even try to, to look for that. So uh, I cannot guarantee that they are very anymore. So, uh, but um, if I'm making a zoom on this region, you see that if I'm choosing d equal to 0 0.85, which is a quite high level of asymmetry, okay, I am still with a variation of 10 gigahertz in the gap, which is quite high. So the trick here is to not only increase the asymmetry, but also to displace the squid and to replace the squid by a unitary junction, and not by the alpha junction. If you do so, you see that you can even mitigate more the, 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 the dependence of the gap on the, on the flux fires. Okay, that's a, that's a trick. So let's come back to uh, our design and let's try to get some expectations. Okay, so we have uh, our tunable flux qubit, but we have only an external magnetic field on the system. So what we expect to see is that when I'm applying a uniform magnetic field on the system, the flux threading the squid, okay, will be equal to the flux threading the qubit multiplied by the ratio of the surfaces. Okay, so here we choose to be have, to have two thirds, two thirds of them. While the flux threading the remaining loop, phi r, will be one third, one third of them. Now, a where will be the optimal point? The optimal point, the point where you expect to have the gap uh, which reaches minimum and which is not the, which is immune to flux noise to first order, okay, is given by this formula. Phi over phi zero minus phi s over two phi zero plus delta phi is equal to k pi, where k is an odd number. So pi, three pi, k pi is equal to pi, three pi, phi pi, whatever. And uh, delta phi here is a small, uh, uh, a small uh, dephasing such that it is given by tangent delta phi equal to d tangent phi s over 2 phi 0. And to check that indeed this is true, you can uh, make the exercise where choosing d equal to 1. And if you choose d equal to 1, you get uh, back the standard relation for uh, non tunable flux qubit phi over phi 0 equal to k. And since now the optimal point depends on, a, on k pi, okay, the flux threading the, uh, the flux threading the squid is also a function of k pi, okay. And as a consequence, the gap and the persistent current of the qubit are function of both i, which is the index of the qubit, and k pi, which is the index of the optimal point at which at which value of the optimal, at which optimal point are you falling? K equal to one, K equal to three, K equal to five, etc. So we put everything inside of a dilution fridge. Uh, this is, maybe I can enter into more details. This here, here is a cryoperm uh, shielding of the, where we put the, the coil, where we put the, the sample. What you see here are circulators, filters, and this is the, the outside of the fridge. And on the outside of the fridge, everything is controlled by an OPX from quantum machine, which uh, modulates uh, the, the, the microwave uh, frequency, which uh, are tuned at the resonator or qubit frequency. So here you see the optical table on which we put the different elements. These are uh, IQ modulators, okay, which uh, uh, here you see switches, here you see uh, variable attenuators. This is for the input, and for the output, you see another uh, modulator, it's a, it plays the role of a demodulator, uh, which is followed by a um, preamplifier, and then coming back to the digitizer of, uh, of the OPX, okay. 
What is important to mention here is that you need to put attenuators at low temperature in order to remove thermal noise. Uh, you need to put the system inside of a double shield of uh, cryoperm and a superconducting shield in order to protect your qubit from uh, magnetic noise. You need to put uh, circulators in order to uh, remove the noise coming from the hemp amplifier. You need to use a hemp amplifier in order to uh, increase the signal. And that's more or less. And here also there is a well-controlled uh, well temperature controlled uh, resistor which allows us to apply a well controlled elect, um, dc current on the on the coil okay so what we get is the following first thing we do we sweep the current on the coil okay and we look for anti crossing of uh, the resonator with the qubit so each qubit will anti cross at its a different position Okay, so we have a kind of puzzle to solve here. We have uh, five qubits, okay? Each qubit can cross at uh, k pi equal to pi, three pi, uh, three pi, five pi, seven pi, nine pi. A little bit of puzzle, which was solved by uh, Tamir uh, Cohen and uh, T. Kai Chang. And when you do that, and after that, once you know who is who, you need to make the spectroscopy of the qubit. You extract from it the gap and the persistent current. And now you can plot the, the gap of the qubit versus the flux threading the squid. And you see that uh, for qubit three, for example, you see these are experimental points. The qubit five is our experimental points. And you see that the theory is matching quite well with what we expect. Well, in fact, it's not so easy to make work the theory. We got the help of uh, Gianluigi to solve this question. Because if we come back to the uh, original uh, system, you see that we have here a big junction. okay, And you see that you have wires. These wires have some kinetic inductance, which modify, which will renormalize the Josephson energy of the junction. So what we had to do is to take this into account. So uh, we renormalize the large junction due to the kinetic inductance of the squid. More, it modifies the, the Josephson energy uh, and also the capacitance. And by doing so, we were able to get a, a nice uh, table, okay, showing the Josephson energy of the of each of the of the Josephson junction in your qubit, the value of alpha, the value of D, the value of theta, uh, which is the ratio between the areas. Uh, and uh, that's very nice. And once we have done that, we can try to look at what is happening to the relaxation and decoherence of the qubit. So I've chosen to show you data, which are the best data, of course. Uh, the data of qubit 3. So for qubit 3, uh, you see that at uh, uh, k pi, uh, for qubit 3 as uh, k equal to 1 or pi, okay, the t1 is fitted to 7.7 .7 microsecond, while the t2 echo is 2.2 microsecond. The, while if we move now to 5 pi, the same qubit, the t1 goes to 5.2 microsecond, T2 echo goes to 3.2 microsecond. We would like to understand this, especially what is the origin of the relaxation of this qubit? Indeed, on a work which is related, we use the same technique, the same fabrication, uh, but on non-tunable flux qubit. We saw that we have a quite, um, general reproducible way to get T1 of the, of the order of 20 microseconds, while uh, T2 echo was rather of the order of 30 micro, 13 microseconds. Okay, so we lost a lot in moving to a tunable uh, flux qubit, especially we lost in T2 echo. Okay, so we want to, uh, in, the, in the end of this talk, how much time do I have? minutes okay so it's good so in, in the end of this talk i would like to understand what is limiting t1 what 
very good. With some questions. So, um, so from this ex from this experiment, we know that uh, most of uh, the losses are coming from dielectric losses. Dielectric losses, as I've mentioned at the beginning, we chose the sapphire wafer in order to reduce as much as possible the dielectric losses. Okay, so the dielectric losses, so the tangent delta, defines the relationship between the resistance of each of the elements we consider and the capacitance of each of these elements. So this is uh, the model, the capacitive model of our system. Okay. And we now replace each of the capacitance by a small source of voltage in series. And uh, we extract from this the, and we calculate the relaxation rate due to this, uh, to, due to this small uh, voltage. We get this nice formula, which uh, relies, uh, which uh, connects the dielectric losses to uh, the capacitive mat uh, capacitance matrix and to the what we call C prime, the weighted capacitance matrix, or if you want, the capacitance matrix multiplied by the tangent delta of the element. And uh, when plotting now all the qubits at different value of uh, kappa, okay, we see that uh, we have a kind of nice behavior here in this region. We have a linear uh, increase of gamma uh, relaxation, gamma intrinsic. And, um, and from this, we can extract the value of tangent delta. But if we do that, we find that tangent delta is rather 5, 10 minus 5. We compare to 10 to the, to the minus 6. So there is a factor 50 here, which needs to be understood. We believe, okay, I have no proof, but we believe that this is uh, this, uh, this high tangent delta is due to some uh, very small difference in the process that we did in for tunable flux qubit and non tunable flux qubit. And this small difference is adding what we call ion meaning of the substrate before depositing aluminum. When doing so, most likely we we damage the surface. And since the surface is so crucial for the dielectric losses, we, we have a price to pay. But there is another element here, which is for us a mystery. What happens above, above 10 gigahertz? Well, I don't know. We don't know. We, we have tried several ways to, to interpret this data, but we didn't find any uh, good answer to this question. So now let's speak about pure dephasing. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, the pure dephasing uh, rate of a flux qubit is mainly due to flux noise, especially away from its optimal point. So this is due to the fact that we have an Hamiltonian, okay, where you, you see we, we have a sigma x term, okay, which depends on the phi minus phi zero over two. And a, and this means that away from the, from the optimal point, the flux noise is dominating the decoherence of the qubit. The flux noise is well known to behave as one of the F noise. So after a little bit of math, it's possible to show that at first order, the rate of dephasing is related to the amplitude of the flux noise multiplied by your ratio, two square root of log two, okay? times the persistent current over delta times epsilon. Okay, so all, all of these elements we have, so except, except the value of A5. So we can fit, in fact, the amplitude of the flux noise in the system. And if we do so, you see that we can extract a quite a good fit, okay, which give us a value of A5 for qubit four at five pi to be 3.5 micro phi zero. And of course, this is the first order, but uh, Tikai, my student, uh, did it well. So he also took into account second order. And that's why it's not a linear line that you see, but uh, there is small uh, parabolic behavior. 
But once again, we have here a problem. Uh, and this problem is coming from uh, our data on pure dephasing rate of non-tunable flux qubit at phi zero over two, the optimal point. So on this data, what we what we what we show here is the pure dephasing rate for different qubits. So you see, we measure the, something like thirty qubits. Okay. And what we see here is that we see that the second order flux noise because we are at the optimal point, so there is not anymore any flux, uh, first order flux noise. So, but we have second order flux noise. So if you look at the second order flux noise, we calculate this and we find a um, small number. Okay, so it's not the main uh, contribution. There is also what people call photon noise. The fact that we are using a cavity in order to measure the resonator means that what we have, we may have, um, short noise of the photon inside of the cavity, which can decoere the qubit, okay? So we can also take this into account. We did that properly, and except uh, one qubit, which, which happened to be too close to the cavity, most of the qubit had some contribution to photon noise, but this contribution was rather small. So we were left in this work, which was done under the same condition as what we have done with the tunable flux qubit, okay, we are left with some unknown contribution that we could attribute to critical current noise. Okay, critical current noise means that when you have um, when you have a junction. Imagine that now you have an electron which is entering inside of the junction itself. This electron is modifying the, the Josephson energy of the junction. It's changing the occupation of the Andreev bond states and it modifies the, 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 the occupation or it modifies the, the, the total energy of the junction. Now this, this in general for Josephson junction is, is known to be very, very small maybe 10 to the minus five of the value of the EJ. But in our case, in the case of a flux qubit, okay, this small, this small variation of alpha may create a big variation of delta because of the dependence of the gap on, the exponential dependence of the gap on the parameter of the junction. And okay, but this does not explain the result for non-tunable flux qubit. This is this maybe explains the result for a non-tunable flux qubit, but this does not explain the result for tunable flux qubit. In a minute, you will see why. Because there is a big difference between standard flux qubit and tunable flux qubit at the optimal point. Indeed, when I have a tunable flux qubit, I have two degrees of freedom, phi s and phi r. This means that the Hamiltonian of my system is not anymore a term which goes like sigma z plus a term which goes like sigma x. There is also a term which goes like sigma z depending on delta phi s and delta phi r, which means that there is a first order contribution to the flux noise, or if you prefer the d omega zero one, so the, 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 the dependence of the gap on phi s or phi r is not equal to zero. So you have a first order contribution, which of course you use the standard formula for flux, or flux noise of, of first order, okay? And you see, you get this curve. Okay, so the dashed line correspond to the uh, first order contribution due to phi s and phi r. What you can see is that when the flux qubit, that when the tunable flux qubit reach its minimal gap, okay, the first order contribution of um, flux noise comes to zero. When the flux qubit comes to its maximal gap, the flux uh, first order contribution due to flux noise goes to zero. 
But in between, this is not zero. So you have first order. In addition to that, you have also second order contribution, which decays like uh, one over uh, one over x. And uh, the conclusion is uh, summarized in this uh, in this uh, table. So here, what what I'm trying to show you is the contribution of uh, dephasing of all the qubits at different optimal points. So for example, uh, one pi is qubit one at pi, one five pi is qubit one at five pi, okay? And now we, we take into account, okay, let's begin by what we, what we first uh, discussed. Critical current noise, okay? So we said for non-tunable flux qubit, for standard flux qubit, it's the main, the major contribution most likely okay so if we do this for if we, if we estimate this for uh, the case of our tunable flux qubit we get a contribution which is very reasonable second thing we discuss that is photon noise variation uh, of a photon inside uh, inside of the cavity and as you can see except for qubit three uh, at three pi which happened to be too close to the cavity and was sensing too much the number of photons, this was also very negligible. And what we get is that indeed, the, the, the dephasing is due to a different kind of flux noise. You have on one hand, the first order flux noise in the main loop, this gamma alt. You have the first order flux noise in the squid loop gamma s and you have second order flux noise so you see that it depends very strongly where you are where the qubit is how much of flux noise you have but it's always most of the most of the graph here is purple indicating that uh, the flux noise is still dominating the decoherence of the tunable flux qubit even at the optimal point okay so let's come to the conclusion what time is it Doing great. Okay, good. Okay, so we had a series of tunable flux qubit. We measured them. We got relaxation time seven microseconds with tunability plus minus three point five gigahertz. This is more than it's almost an order of magnitude better than what was in the state of the art. We have relaxation times which are most likely limited by dielectric losses. Okay, and we know how to reduce that by an order of magnitude by doing the things properly. But we don't know how what is happening above 10 gigahertz. It's a mystery. We have pure dephasing time, which is limited by flux noise for tunable flux qubit, even at the optimal point. Okay. But we know that it would, should be possible to find better design especially by exchanging junction or reducing further the tunability, which will allow us to go even better and to come closer and closer to a non-tunable flux qubit. So future perspectives. Uh, one, among the future perspectives, I'm, I'm uh, concluding on what I'm uh, at the beginning of it, I have advertised. So uh, what about spins? So uh, this is an ongoing experiment, uh, but I can show you that what we have done, we have done flux qubit, which have a very thin constriction, typically 20 nanometer width on a 500 nanometer uh, length. And this allows us to uh, implant, we fabricate this flux qubit on top of a very well localized implants of bismuth spins. And uh, the idea is, of course, to, uh, to, to couple strongly to the spins and uh, to be able to store the information in the spins and to get it back from the spins to be in the so-called strong coupling regime. So this is going to, to come, ongoing work. But more generally, I think we, with the flux qubit, we have here a tool 
which allows us to speak with many systems. Nanomechanical resonators, for example. One of my students, Tamar, is working on nano uh, beams on diamond, okay, which have frequency of oscillation typically in the gigahertz, and is trying to couple them to a uh, flux qubit. The coupling should be strong. And of course, the system would be perfect to store. Uh, you know, it will replace. It would replace eventually uh, macroscopic cavities, uh, semiconductor semiconducting heterostructures. I think that it's clear. Nuclear spin, because it's not only once you speak with the electron spin, you have access to the nuclear spin. So, the, if you want the flux qubit, you can see the flux qubit as a macroscopic spin. It's a, so the spin of macroscopic dimension that allows you to speak with a spin of microscopic dimension, which is electron spin. But then after that, you have a spin of microscopic dimension, the electron spin, that can speak with a smaller spin, which is a nuclear spin. Eventually, this is the, the idea. The idea is to be able to access to this spin, nuclear spin, would open the, I think, and pave the way for building a spin processor, which would uh, spin quantum processor. And uh, that's my perspective, at least. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank you for listening, um, to present you more or less people uh, of, the, of the group. So uh, especially uh, Tikai, uh, who made most of the experiments in this, uh, in this uh, of this work, Itamar and uh, Tamir who participated, and uh, thank you once again for uh, receiving me very well at uh, Abu Dhabi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stern, for the very nice uh, and introductory talk. Congratulations on the results. We had a couple of questions. I guess there are some more questions. Young people first, they have a preference. Uh, wait. No. <laughs> um, yeah, Maxime, please. Uh, I'm not sure if that question will make sense. Here, please. please. Uh, sorry, can I move my back? Can you, uh, can you pass in the. Uh, uh, how do you know that you are at one pi, two pi, or three pi? Because that will depend on your external magnetic field that you involve in the Audrey, it's a puzzle. It's very, it was very delicate, in fact. Uh, you, you, okay, so what you have to do is to, um, okay, so you, you, you see these anti crossings? Okay, so you have not only these anti crossing because this is only. This is minus pi if you want. This is plus pi. But then after that, you have three pi, you have five pi, you have seven pi, you have nine pi. Okay. And of course, there is a, because of the choice of uh, s equal to two thirds, so this two thirds makes uh, the things re uh, repeating. So uh, we have several indicators. We have the coupling with the resonator, which should be, which, um, the mutual inductance between the flux qubit and the, and the resonator should be conserved. And then you should have the distance between uh, the minus pi and plus pi, or the minus, two, uh, minus three pi and plus three pi, which should be, should be conserved also. So, so yeah, yeah, in brief, it's very complicated, but the, the, the idea is that each, flux qubit at its, as its own size, OK? So each. Even just for a given qubit? Yes. Or if there was only one qubit? Uh, if there was only one qubit, everything would be simple. You would see, you would see the first crossing, OK? Then you see the second crossing. Uh, oh, because we. Um, you have seen in the experimental system, we, we build those experimental system inside of cryoperm shielding, inside of superconducting shielding, so that when we put zero current, 
we are close to zero magnetic field. Okay, so then. Um, well, no, it, it's not uh, not at this level. Uh, uh, but 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 you are, you are right that there are some some way so there are always a little bit of uh, of mismatch, but uh, not. Uh, yeah, okay. No, no, no. Okay. Then if you're comparing with that zero, yeah, yeah. you're comparing with this. Yes, yes. Um, any other question? Yes, still. Um, say, again, on this point. So you have different optimal points, right? I presume that you have a very complicated landscape. Uh, of the other levels, no? Levels. So yeah, the two levels. Yes. That are say they define a qubit as a specific uh, operating operating point, operating condition, right? Yes. And then you have the other levels. Yes, but the other level is very very far. Always uh, far away or yes, is the landscape because like, it depends on the other. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Yes, they are always they are always far away in typically typically tens of gigahertz above, okay. And uh, don't forget that very as you go away from the optimal point, you may move by a millify zero. You are already a few gigahertz above. So um, the coupling of, uh, for example, uh, uh, because you can think also of the coupling between two qubits, okay. So if you are at the optimal point of one qubit, you are not at the optimal point of the second. So the second is also very far, tens of gigahertz above. We, we design the distance between so the different size of the qubits such that there will, no over, there will not be, be no overlap between them. And even though you can see that sometimes there is a little bit of overlap. But it does not mean that because of there is a, an overlap, it does not mean that the qubits are, are close. Actually, I've also a difference of one degree. And, and is, so you have two parameters. One is alpha. Yes. And one is beta. Yes. Right. So alpha means that it's the asymmetry between the four, uh, yes. the four groups to take uh, one uh, junction, which is different from the other. It's the asymmetry. Also, D was the asymmetry. Yes. Right. Can you? No, I'm can, okay. confused on the D versus alpha. <clears throat> okay. D is the ratio between this junction and this junction. Okay. But basically, this the equivalent junction here is much bigger than the junction alpha. Alpha is the smallest junction of the system. Because our students still going to stay here for a couple of days, right? So I guess that we can, people can continue with more this week. Uh, yes, until uh, okay. until uh, Thursday. Thursday. Okay, great. So there's still time for continuing chatting. So we thank him very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you.